Baruch Hashem. Okay, with that, I guess uh, we'll begin. Uh, again, welcome everyone, everyone who's, uh, who's joined. Um, it's good to see everyone. Hope everyone is, uh, is doing well, is having a good week. Um, our uh, speaker this evening, who we're going to learn from and learn with, is Rabbi Dr. Fran Kannerfogel, and he'll get a full uh, introduction in just a minute. I just want to thank uh, everyone who uh, helped with arranging uh, the, the talk tonight, especially Ellen and Yitzi. And uh, we also want to thank Yitzi and Rachel, who are uh, sponsoring uh, tonight's talk. So uh, thank you uh, to the Ehrenbergs for that as well. And um, I'm also going to, uh, in just a minute, give it over to Yitzi actually to introduce uh, Rabbi Dr. Kenner Fogel. Yitzi knows uh, Rabbi Dr. Kenner Fogel uh, for, uh, for a very long time. And um, even though we were hearing before, before we officially began, all the connections to Boston uh, and to Brookline that uh, uh, Professor Kenner Fogel has. Um, uh, before the introduction, just two um, technical points. One, just everyone knows. Uh, we are recording the class tonight and it'll be posted um, on the Shoals YouTube channel if uh, you know of anyone who wants to see it who is not here now. And uh, also, if you have any questions, just feel free to um, put them in the chat box to me and uh, we'll see how things are going. Either I'll ask the question or I'll, if you want to, uh, me to call on you, I'll give you the opportunity to, uh, to ask the question and, uh, and uh, hopefully that will work. And, uh, so with that, I, uh, I'll turn over to Yitzi to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Rabbi Hellman. Um, I'm delighted that it's an opportunity to introduce uh, Rabbi Kanafogo for tonight's lecture. Um, he's the E. Billy Ivory Professor of Jewish History at uh, Yeshiva University Stern College for Women. I never had the privilege of um, attending any of his classes at Yeshiva as much as I may have tried to register on their in a sent uh, computerized registration system. It never let me do that. But I know from the multiple plaques that are on his wall in his study um, that he's gotten many, many, many teaching awards from the students. So uh, I know that his teaching uh, is outstanding in a uh, formal academic setting. I've had the, uh, been fortunate enough to um, hear him on many occasions. Often I was too young to really appreciate it and Maybe my role was just handing out the source sheets <laughs> I did on, on, for many, many years. Um, he's a, a, an author, has written at least three books. Or I only have three. There's probably more out there now. I need to update my collection. Um, many, many articles. And I'm very uh, excited to hear, this, uh, to hear this talk, which is entitled the non-reception of Rambam's Mishnah Torah in, in medieval Ashkenaz. Rabbi Kanerfogel, thank you for coming. Well, thank, thank, thank you. Listen, I, as I told uh, the rabbi, it's not that hard. All you have to do is sit and turn on your phone. Uh, although I, I would love to go to Yerushalayim, to Boston, to any nice place. Uh, and that's not in the cards right now. But I thank everyone for, uh, for joining in. It's to your credit. Uh, and the answer is you have to try to get into my graduate seminar. That they'll probably let you in uh, for because the gender is not a problem uh, in any case. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, forgive the uh, it's not disembodied because you can see me at least, which is, you know, whether that's meritorious is debatable. But uh, please, if there are questions during, if it's something that's not clear or something that, you know, you think is germane to what we're doing, please ring in to the uh, to the authorities and they will, they will let you in as, uh, as it seems appropriate. I, I wanna treat an interesting problem. Uh, I was gonna say it's a good Boston problem because when I think of Boston, I think of Professor Tursky, Zatzal and the Rav Zatzal, and, uh, whatever order we'll put them in. And so anything about the Rambam certainly plays in Boston, no matter who's there on a particular evening. And I wanna treat a problem and you have it, uh, the, the um, uh, sheet that will go up on the screen, I guess in a moment, is really the, um, the outline of the talk so that you can follow. See, I just tell you, he puts it up very good. Uh, it really is the outline of what we're gonna talk about. There are a lot of moving parts, but it's basically a fairly simple story. And I titled it, not shockingly, but somewhat uh, provocatively, the non-reception of Rambam's Mishnah Torah in medieval Ashkenaz. Rambam's Mishnah Torah was a work that uh, needs no introduction and can't be introduced in less than 
uh, I don't know how many words, but Rambam's major halachic work was a work for the ages. And it was exceptionally popular almost from the moment that it was written in every place but Northern Europe talking here about Northern France and Germany, what we call Ashkenaz writ large. Uh, if you look at the stats, I'm an inveterate sports fan, so if you look at the stats, uh, and I will say without getting into too much political trouble, I'm a Yankee fan, it's been not a great year. Uh, you folks are in Boston, it's been not a good year at all. I hope it'll be better next year, but we have to talk about stats. Let's talk about Rambam stats. Mishnah Torah is completed uh, in 1177 or 1178, it's not clear. Uh, you know, which the Hebrew calendar and, uh, and secular calendar don't exactly correspond, but it's certainly done by 1178. And it gets to southern France. Uh, it's completed, of course, in Egypt, but it gets to southern France by 1194. No surprise there. The Ram has a tremendous fan club in Provence, in southern France. They get the book very quickly, and great books of this type do travel quickly, even in the medieval world. Uh, we know that, for example, because the Rivet, Rav Avram ben David of Poskier, writes his glosses to Rambam's Mishnah Torah uh, before he dies in 1198. So between 1178 and 1198, the book has not only reached southern France, but it allows someone to write uh, quite comprehensive uh, uh, comments on it. Um, and we also have the report of another great medieval Talmudist, uh, the Rama uh, Abu Lafia, of Mayor Halevi Abu Lafia in Toledo, um, who reports and who actually polemicizes against Mishnah Torah. He's got some issues with Rambam's philosophy, but it's a work that he has to deal with. And both the Ravad and the Rama in particular talk about its tremendous popularity there. So we don't have an exact date of when it reaches Northern Europe. But not only is it reasonable to assume that it reaches there not too long after 1194, but we do have a few uh, French Balei HaTosvot who mention Mishnah Torah, albeit about three times. Uh, they are writing around the year 1200. So they mention Rambam about three times, literally one, two, three, couple with regard to the text of the Bracha Achron al Hamichya, uh, and never to decide the halacha. In other words, they will cite the work of Maimonides as a corroboration in one, two, or three pieces, and that's about it. And we'll look on the other sheet in a moment. I'll give you an interesting example that has to do with that. But if we continue the stats further, the silence with respect to Mishnah Torah in Northern France and in Germany as well continues, but on the Northern French side, if we look at all the Tosafot, all the glosses that were composed primarily in Northern France throughout the second half of the 12th and throughout the 13th centuries, what we call Tosfot or Tosfis, whatever your particular pronunciation is, um, the so-called printed Tosfot to Shas. You go to the big Shas and you go looking and somebody did the homework for us. You find Rambam's name mentioned in Tosfot exactly twice. Once in Brachot, again, having to do with that bracha achrona issue that I mentioned before, and once in Menachot, having to do with tefillin, and that's it. That's it. Um, and that's through the late 13th century. Now, you know, what would have been the right number to mention Mishnah Torah? 10 times, 20 times, five times, 14 times, twice says it's not being used. And if we just sort of take other measures of the, uh, what I'm calling here, the non-reception, and the question is why? Um, if we look and you have this in the last paragraph of this first part of the stats, um, one of the last French works written during the Tosafist period, the so-called Sefer Mitzvot Katan, the small Sefer HaMitzvot, it also really has an original name, Amudei Agola. It's not simply a short Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, which we'll get to. It's a different work, but it's a collection of the mitzvot with brief discussion and plenty of glosses uh, by Rabbeinu Peretz of Korbei, two colleagues, Yitzchak of Korbei, Peretz of Korbei. This work is written around 1270. Um, Maybe, so, so the Rambam has been out for a hundred years almost, and it's been in, in Northern France for decades and decades. The best manuscripts of this whole Sefer Mitzvot Katan complex mention Rambam perhaps 10 times altogether. So this tells us that again, it's being largely ignored for some reason in 
France. And the question is, can we understand why? Now, some have immediately suggested I'm not the first one to raise this problem. Um, three other people have raised it the last uh, 20 years or so, and they've offered their own solutions, which I found a little bit unsatisfying. So I try to come up with my own, and you're going to hear mine, but I'll certainly gladly tell you where the other ones are. Um, some have suggested cogently, but I think not necessarily correctly in this case, that we know that Rambam's philosophy uh, was not terribly well accepted in Northern France. Uh, we have the so-called Maimonidean controversy, especially the one, the phase that takes place in the 1230s. And there is a whole uh, uh, seeming problem with Rabbanate Sarfat. Uh, Nachmanides writes a letter to Rabbanait Sarfat at that time, telling them to please not be so harsh about Rambam, although the issue there is more his guide for the perplexed, perhaps, in the first part of Mishnah Torah. So some have said, well, the Tosafists didn't quote Maimonides because he's not their cup of tea. Uh, philosophically and hashkafically, and uh, I don't want to use modern terms on this, I think uh, we'll stick with the medieval terms. Uh, philosophy has a medieval uh, pedigree. Uh, and so that will explain why they ignore Rambam uh, uh, in their Talmudic studies. Uh, not an unreasonable solution. By the time we're done tonight, I think you'll see it's not the best solution. And we'll talk some more about that. Okay. There is a major exception or two in the 13th century, but it really is a localized exception of a Northern French Tosafist who does use Maimonides' Mishnah Torah. And again, we're focused on his halachic work. We're not talking about Moron of Uchum at this moment. We'll say more things about some of that later. But as far as his main halachic work, uh, we do have the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, the large Sefer HaMitzvot, put together by Rab Moshe of Kusi, uh, who dies around 1250 or so. He's doing this work in the 1240s. Uh, if you like Barbara Tuckman, uh, the calamitous, um, um, uh, a distant mirror of the calamitous 14th century. Uh, Barbara Tuckman has some great historical sort of fiction based on reality involving the Count of Kusi and Rav Moshe of Kusi. But to us, he is the author of primarily the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, very important work of Jewish law. And you probably know that Sefer Mitzvot Gadol is the one French work which quotes Rambam all the time, frequently, um, and really is modeled in some ways after Mishnah Torah. And from there, and this is in the paragraph marked the exceptions here, from there, there are a number of smog, say from Mitzvot Gadol, smog, those are the Rosh Tevis, that's not the meteorological condition in Los Angeles. Uh, from the smog, the sort of smog imitators, there are other uh, summaries of Jewish law, which follow suit. Uh, as I mentioned here, something called the Kitsur Smog. That is a shortening of the Smog. Uh, there is a Sidur by Yaakov, the Chazan of London, called Eitz Chaim, a kind of a Mahzor, which quotes Mishnah Torah a lot, which summarizes Jewish law. But with the exception of the Smog and his allies, if you will, um, which is very explainable. Uh, it really isn't cited, uh, and we'll come to one other exception in a second. The smog's use of Mishnah Torah, though, is readily explained, and there's a reason why he's the only one who does this. As the smog tells us, from Moshe Mikutsi, he traveled to southern France and into Spain and spent plenty of time there. In fact, there's a fascinating text that was published by the late Professor Yisrael Tashma, which sort of talks about a yeshiva for Bali, Chuva that he wanted to open in the area of Spain, it seems it was him, to teach them. He basically preached to the masses in all of these areas in France, in southern France, in Spain, to return to mitzvot. So if you're going to be preaching in Spain at this time, you better cite Mishnah Torah because that has really become the primer for Jews living in Spain at this time. It's not just Rabat of Pasquier or Ramah of Toledo and others, many others who are looking at Mishnah Torah academically and in a deep way. Uh, somebody once said, I think with a lot of correctness, Mishnah Torah in Spain from the time that it reaches there and, and throughout the 13th century is like the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. It's memorized by plain people too, not just in Yemen, but in Spain as well. Um, and so uh, 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 if you're going to talk to people in Spain, uh, you're going to want to talk in the language of Mishnah Torah. And the fact that Moses of Kusi 
went to Spain to do this preaching and to do all of this interacting is where he got a hold of Mishneh Torah, which is where he became familiar with it. And he is really the exception that proves the rule until the very end of the 13th century. In other words, from 1200 until the last decades of the 13th century, he is the only Frenchman, French Tosafist, who cites Mishneh Torah. Again, the Sefer Mitzvot Katan by Isaac of Corbet and the Gloss of Peretz of Corbet do not, relatively speaking. He's the only, only one who cites it with any uh, frequency. The only other exception in the exceptions column is Marami Rutenberg, mayor of Rothenburg, who of course is from Germany, but studied in Northern France. Marami Rutenberg and his students, including the Rosh, including the Mordechai and others, um, and especially Hagahot Maimuniot, his student who wrote glosses on Mishnah Torah, a German uh, student who wrote glosses on Mishnah Torah, um, they cite Mishnah Torah extensively. Maram dies in 1293. The students die. Uh, Mordechai is killed in 1298, Al-Kiddush Hashem. Uh, and he doesn't even cite it that much, but the Rosh and the Hagos Maimonios die in the early 14th century. Um, and there's an explanation for why they uh, cite it. At this point, Ashkenaz is going downhill. The expulsion of the Jews in northern France takes place in 1306, northern and central France. There's no expulsion in Germany, but there are tremendous persecutions, which cause, again, Mordechai is killed during one of those persecutions. The Rosh Asher Ben Yechiel escapes to Spain. Um, and basically, Maharami Rutenberg takes the approach that both Rif, Yitzchak Alfasi, Fez, North Africa, Spain, and Mishneh Torah should now be consumed in Ashkenaz. They, apparently these books were available, but especially Mishneh Torah was not that much cited. Marami Rutenberg, the way I see it, makes an executive decision, which is that by hooking Ashkenazic learning to, and I use the term advisedly, but intentionally, these two twin towers of Sephardic learning, Mishneh Torah and Hilchot Harif, that will actually preserve the Ashkenazic material. So I think it's a mission of preservation. It's a midst of unification. And Maharami Rutenberg says lovely things about Mishnah Torah for the first time ever. Not that anybody say anything bad, but he talks about it as you must, you must work with this book. Uh, although as I note in my uh, paragraph here at the very, very end, the very last words, uh, he describes Mishnah Torah as akin to the Urim V'tumim. Now, if you call a work Urim V'tumim, you're saying that this work is an oracle, right? The Urim V'tumim. This work will tell you everything you need to know. Exceptionally high praise, right? Uh, except for my mother, Aleah Shalom, my father, nobody called my works the Urim V'tumim. Uh, Mishnah Torah is called the Urim V'tumim. You'll say that's very high praise. But it's very, very slightly a left-handed compliment, I have to say. Why? What does it mean that something is the Urim V'tumim? It means it will tell you everything you need to know, but how does the Urim V'tumim operate? That we don't know. Exactly how the Urim V'tumim work, we don't quite have the full picture. That is a famous Ashkenazi critique of Mishnah Torah, which the Ravid of Poskier shared. The Ramam didn't give his sources. So even though he's praising Mishnah Torah to the sky, Maharam you know, he's an Ashkenazic uh, Baal HaTosvot, uh, you know, forerunners of literature, Rashi Yeshiva. There's a little bit of uh, irony there. Um, and that was a standard complaint of, or even the smog, Ramosh Mikuti talks about Mishnah Torah as halom below poter at one point. It's a dream without an interpretation. It's great stuff, but you can't always know where Ramam got it from because he doesn't give us his sources explicitly as we all very well know. But so bottom line, let me put it all together for you um, to this point. Um, there is a glaring absence, if you look at the stats, a glaring omission of the citation of Ramam's halachic work, Mishnah Torah, not talking about, by the way, written in Hebrew, written in the King's Hebrew and the Queen's. Beautiful Hebrew, over la Socher, right? Everybody can understand Mishnah Torah. Not talking about Moronavuchim, which was written in Arabic and translated. Not talking about Pirush HaMishnayot, even, which was translated from the Arabic. Talking about, uh, uh, about Mishnah Torah, written in Hebrew, written beautifully, covers everything, hardly cited at all in Northern France and Germany. Again, the fact that it's cited originally only as a proof source of proofs, never as a deciding factor in Halacha is suggestive, but it's just not cited that much at all. In the printed Shas Tosot, barely at all. 
Sefer Mitzvot Katan, hardly at all. Smag, Sefer Mitzvot Kadol, and its allied works are the exceptions which prove the rule. And again, Maharam in his circle at the very, at the late 13th century, moving into the 14th, that's a hundred years after the work has been written and, and 80 years after it's uh, uh, reached uh, the north of Europe. So that uh, is a tofa'asha omerit darsheni. That's a phenomenon that requires explanation. Very I careful, mean, can I, can I uh, do we have a question? Uh, Ari, please. do you wanna ask your question or should-, should uh... Please, please feel free. Um, well, yeah, I, I, you think you might you may have covered this already a little bit, but uh, did the early Rishonim cite the riff, um, uh, you know, like the toast vote and, and whatnot, or was it only the later? Okay, the the riff gets a little better play. Good question, and and I'll give you the the, the best answer that I can. The riff does get more play, um, and this is interesting. And I'm going to give you two more stats once you raise it, which we'll put into the final interpretation. Toast vote cites the riff about 50 times, 5-0, which is a very respectable number. And they cite him very respectfully. He's also cited in Germany by the Ravia and his father already. He cited already in the early 13th century by Rabbi Yehuda Sirleon, a teacher of Moses of Kusi. So the riff does get used more quickly. But here's another interesting stat. The Balei HaTosfot believed that the riff's Rebbe and it's not quite exact, there was somebody in between, uh, was a very early Rishon named Rabbeinu Hananel of Kerwan of North Africa. Uh, again, there's a little bit of a gap there, but it's not a big gap. Rabbeinu Hananel was cited by Tosfot hundreds of times. So there is an interesting gap here. Rabbeinu Hananel of North Africa is cited uh, uh, about 10 times as much as the riff, about 500 times, no joke. Look at any toast, on any page of toast, what you'll see an abbreviation, Reish, what uh, my mother used to call a Shmechik, Reish, Shmechik, Chet. You have to see, is it Rabbeinu Tam, is it Rabbeinu Hanan, or Rabbeinu Hanan is all over the place. As opposed to the Riff, who is cited respectably, respectable, you know, uh, respectably, uh, respectable frequency, but not nearly as much as the teacher, and Rambam who's barely cited as, at, all, at all. And there's gonna be a, a not uncommon solution here, so I'm glad you brought that up. I hope I haven't muddied the waters. And, and again, you're gonna see at the end, this is not gonna be, God forbid, an Ashkenazi Sfaradi bias. You know, this is not the Army-Navy game. It's not, you're on the wrong team, we don't need you. I think there's something much, which, which again has also been proposed, that there's a sort of an anti Sfaradi bias. First of all, the Rabbein Hananel, uh, belies that. He's again Rabbi Nuchananel of North Africa. He's cited all the time. And the Riff is cited plenty. So it's not going to be a philosophical bias. It's not going to be an Ashkenazi Sfaradi bias. It's going to be an interesting learning issue that we're going to develop right now. Does that solve your, uh, your question? Whoever asked that question. Ari, oh, yeah, that... Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, we have one more question, right, uh, right, careful, can we, can we have one more person jump yes, in with a question a or suggestion? Mike, Mike, question, do you want, I'm worried point Mike point. is going to steal your thunder, because, but Mike, do you want to, um, uh, do you want to uh, uh, share your comment? Well, Tosfot is always trying to deal with Talmudic text directly, and Rabbeinu Hanano and the Riff are, you know, al Seder HaShas, so the Mishnah Torah is always harder to connect to Shas, and after uh, all, Kesha that... Mishnah is 300 years after Tosfot's. Right. That is, that is correct. And I'm going to expand on certain parts of that in an even different way, right? In other words, to some extent, it's form and function. That's certainly correct, right? I'll say it even more strongly in a few minutes, but that's fine. Uh, that, that means I'm getting through, right? But again, if it's about the style, and I don't mean style, you know, did you write with a pen or a pencil? If it's about the style and method of interpretation, so that's not a regional bias, that's not a disciplinary bias, that's not a, a uh, you know, a hashkafic bias, it's an issue of learning. And we're going to talk about this in, in a little bit in a different way coming up. So actually, that's, a, that's not a stealing the thunder comment, that's a helping everybody understand this very well comment. So I appreciate that. It means that the person who made it also understands it very well. So I'm pleased that you, that you said that. Okay, we're going to come to some more of that, because there's also a flip side. We're going to see, I don't want to let it all out now, I'll do it in the next few minutes, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, we're going to see that the Tosafists of northern France and Germany don't have problems citing Rambam. 
in other contexts, which will fit into what we've just discussed too. So hang on, but thank you very much for that helpful comment. I do wanna, as we end this halftime, uh, let's see if we can go to the other page for a moment, the, the sources page. I just wanna make, yes, thank you. If you look at source number one, we're not gonna read it together, but these are yours to keep and, and please by all means, uh, you have my email on this thing. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email. I can send you copies of things, whatever you like. Uh, the first text here, actually is a, uh, a piece, a little shtickle, literally, from the Cairo Geniza that a colleague and I had the privilege of publishing about 20-something years ago already. Uh, the colleague, being an excellent scholar of the Geniza, is the one who identified it. His name is Moshe Sokolo, and he was also my teacher at one point, and we were very good friends. And he said, I've got a passage here, which I think was written by a French Tosafist, but it's in the Geniza, and it, you know, that's the name that matches up, but I don't understand what's, we, we can't quite figure out what's happening here. And what we discovered working on it together is that this is the first instance that I know of, of a French Tosafist, a pedigreed French Tosafist, citing Rambam, citing Mishnah Torah to effectively decide a matter of Jewish law. So not just for a little you know, proof text, uh, he has it too, but really citing Rambam in a pivotal, pivotal place. But when I tell you who this Tosafist is, it sort of makes the question even stronger. Uh, this is a question of tefillin. Uh, again, I, I know there are ladies on too, so you may not be quite as familiar, although the gentleman may not be so familiar either. But we know there's a difference between Rashi's tefillin and Rabbeinu Tom's tefillin, which has to do with the Seder HaParshios primarily, the order in which the portions that are put in the tefillin are placed, in the Shalrosh, the Shalyan, and so on. And the question is, who's right? Very vexing conundrum, right? So that's so, such a big machloket that there are Anshay Masa, who to this day put on two pairs, you know, switch off. Uh, uh, you know, most people put on Rashi's tefillin, but this was an issue. So the question comes up, whose tefillin should we put on? And this Tosafist, who I'll name in a second, cites Rambam uh, in favor of Rashi's approach. So it's Rashi and Rambam against Rabbeinu Tam and some other sources. That's, you know, pretty much a slam. That's okay. The Tosafist being cited is somebody named Yosef ben Baruch. Joseph ben Baruch originated in Clisson in northern France. He was a student of Samson of Sanchim Shomishans, who made Aliyah. They both made Aliyah. Several Tosafists made Aliyah around the year 1210. There are interesting discussion about that too. I've written about that long, long time ago, and others have as well. Um, and so uh, uh, this Yosef, in fact, he's referred to in Tosfot, this Yosef ben Baruch as Rabbi Yosef Yerushalayim. Right, he retired to Jerusalem, so that's how they called him. He is the first to cite Mishnah Torah as a deciding work. And the reason that this little passage, and we actually had a paleographer uh, analyze the original text, and he thought it was an autograph. He thought it was indeed a, a Northern European hand, not a, not a Middle Eastern hand. So this may have been Rabbi Yosef writing his own little tshuva here, uh, as it's indicated. Um, and uh, so, but, but this explains a lot. Why is, and Yosef ben Baruch again dies somewhere in the 1210s. Uh, why is Yosef ben Baruch citing Mishnah Torah this, in this way? Because he's reached Eretz Yisrael, where Mishnah Torah is being used, so to speak, it's a critical work there. He becomes very intimately familiar with it. And he says, hey, let's bring the Ramam into the discussion. Um, and, uh, and that's how it lands up in the Cairo Geniza, because it's being written not in France. This truth is being written, this, this psaac is being written in, um, in, um, uh, in Eretz Yisrael. So he is a gr another great exception to prove the rule. And uh, there are some follow-ups on this too, in terms of who had this psaac. So just a, an example of, of you know, what's not happening in Europe, what might be happening elsewhere. Okay. But, but again, it's not a question of availability. It's a question of sort of focus. All right, let's return to, we'll go back to this page at the end. Let's return, Yitzi, please, to the script. And let's go to the solution. So the, the solution that was proposed is certainly a good one. But I want to now take into account where Rambam is cited more frequently in Northern Europe. And not that I was holding out on you, but now let's go a step further and we'll take the first solution and expand it in a couple of different directions. So I propose the solution is to look at, is to first of all, look at something which seems to be against everything I just said. <laughs> 
which is how I like to teach. Uh, <laughs> let's create confusion. From the confusion will emerge absolute clarity, not confusion, but certainly competing theories, and we'll come out with a, uh, a point of clarity. Um, there is a work that's produced in uh, uh, Northern Europe uh, uh, in the mid 13th century, almost exactly contemporaneous with the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, perhaps a little, le little less well known, but a very important work, a voluminous work. It's called the Sefer Or Zarua. There's an interesting derivation to that name, but we're not going to do that now. But there's something interesting to say there. And it's written, as you see here, by Isaac Ben Moses Yitzhak ben Moshe of Vienna. He became the Rav of Vienna toward the end of his life. But Rabbi Yitzchak ben Moshe or Zarua was originally from some um, central European location. He says he's from Eretz Hagar, which either means Hungary, Hagar, Hungary, or perhaps Slavic lands, Hagar Shifchat Sarai, right? So he's from, he comes from central Europe. He travels to the Rhineland where he studies with several leading Tosafists there. And he even makes it to Paris after 1215, um, when he, and he studies there with Yitzchak Sirleon, in fact, he makes reference to the Fourth Lateran Council's decree that Jews must wear a badge. It wasn't really enforced that well, but they talk about how to wear this badge on Shabbos, one of the first references to this decree in a Jewish source. But in any case, Sefer Or Zeruah is a voluminous work of halacha, which cites Mishneh Torah not infrequently, but as I say here, selectively. And the same thing is true, as I indicate in this paragraph under the solution, with a colleague of Isaac Ben Moses. They both studied with the same teacher in the Rhineland, Simcha of Spire. The colleague's name is Rabbi Yeshaya Detrani, an Italian who came to the Rhineland to study. And the two of them, in some cases, barely cite Mishnah Torah, but all of a sudden in other areas, they cite him to use a scientific term, a ton. Let me talk about the Sefer or Zerua. It's clear that he had, and he, so again, he has appeared in Northern France, but he's centered more in the Rhineland and then eventually in back to sort of more Central Europe. He has Mishnah Torah. He cites Mishnah Torah altogether 160 times. Again, the technical term for that is a lot. Good, not the part in Israel, a lot, good. But in most cases, I would say with three exceptions, these citations by the Or Zarua, you have to take my word for it, but it's all documented. If you want the article on this, I can send it to you. We can talk about that afterwards, but that's fine. Um, all the data is there, crunch the numbers. Um, Virtually all of the areas of citation, except three, are what I call, again, a technical term, onesies. Once in Hilchot Megillah, actually probably twice, but onesies or twosies. Once in Hilchot Pesach. Once in Hilchot, uh, 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 I'm trying to pick examples that won't you know, run uh, difficulty. Once in Hilchot Staka. Once in Hilchot, in other words, the Orzarua treats all areas of Jewish law. It's a very discursive and extensive, or it's extensive and discursive. You got not easy to find things there always, or there are Maftechot um, that he wrote and so on and so forth. Um, and he cites Rambam here and there and here and there and here and there, which I wouldn't get excited about. In fact, some people said, yeah, he cites Rambam here and there. Uh, as one scholar wrote, he does not engage the Rambam um, and uh, I joked because sometimes when he cites the Ram, he'll cite him with some other authorities. So I joked that according to that view, you know, sort of cite the Ram together with someone else. Uh, he, they weren't engaged and they didn't even, he didn't even allow him to have Yichud, right? In other words, he cites him with others, but that's a bad joke. Um, however, there are three areas in Mishnah Torah where Ra Rambam is cited by the Or Zarua tremendously in terms of number and in terms of impact, and I will name them and we'll talk about, and again, if one of our listeners wants to hazard a guess as to why, I'll take it because it will help me be clear to you. The three areas where he doesn't do onesies, he cites Mishnah Torah all the time, are A, or one, Hilchot Shabbat Ve'eruvin, where he cites Rambam tens of times. Hilchot uh, one, Hilchot, he has a section called Hilchot Igun, Hilchot Igun Vigitin, 
right? In other words, how to make sure that if God forbid a divorce is needed, it's done properly, and we don't have agunot problems, medieval, modern, or otherwise, right? How do we make sure that if a marriage has to end, it's ended properly, so to speak, and, and the, the, the impact is proper on all sides and so on and so forth in the best sense? Again, there it's not even so much a matter of how many times, but in 25 simanim, in 25 sections, which deal with this issue, Rambam is in 12 of them, in half of them. And the Rambam opens some of these sections of let's open with the Rambam, or let's bring in the Rambam as the closer. In other words, this is not just for support. This is not just for a, a you know, a clarification. This is Rambam as the boss. In fact, at one point he says that the Rambam I, he thinks might be right in this, trying to allow this particular situation, but he thinks the Ram has gone too far, but he knows he meant well. In other words, he's so great, he pushed a little too far. So it's not just engagement, it's really veneration, and it's, can I get more? Uh, at one point, he wants to pask in the Orzarua like the Rambam against the Rashbam. Rashbam, Rabbeinu Tam's brother, Rashi's of the grandson, oldest grandson, uh, Rajbam is a, a, a king of Ashkenaz, a king of northern France. The Rambam may not come out. So it's not just the volume, it's the strategic citation. And I'll come back to talk about why I think this is true. And the third area where he cites the Rambam all the time are in what I'll call from the second chapter of Bav Metzia to the fifth the sort of uh, 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 that covers laws of lost objects, laws of uh, watchmen, uh, laws of interest, laws of commerce, right? all kinds of economic law. Also in Hilchot Sanhedrin, laws of Batei Din. Again, the Rambam is a very frequent guest of the Orza Ruas. So, you know, you can say, well, maybe by now people are using it, but this is well before Marami Rutenberg. Again, it, it, Orzaroa has never been in Spain like the smog. All of a sudden, the Orzaroa is using the Rambam in three areas tremendously. And just to add, Isaac of Trani, very similar. We have from him Psakim, we have from him rulings. Um, uh, we have Tosfo from him as well. He barely cites Rambam at all, ever, except in Hilchot Nidarim Ushvuot, the laws of vows and oaths, right? Nidarim and Shvuos, right? Kol Nidre. There he again cites the Rambam all the time. And he says, look at this Rambam here. Ah, you know, he becomes a brisker. We could learn it this way. We could learn it that way. I like this formulation. I like that. All of a sudden, he can't get enough of Rambam. So if it was just Rabbi Shai Dutron, he would say, well, he didn't get, he only got that, he only got that volume. But the Orza Rua has, has everything. So the question is, you know, Sesame Street, why are these areas not like the others? You know, uh, why are these three, right? Uh, what's true about Hilchot Shabbat for the Orza Rua? Hilchot Gitten Vaguna, and, and Dine Mamanos, essentially, Bav Metzia, right? Monetary law, economic law, commercial law, and so on. What's true there that makes the Rambam all of a sudden so downright attractive to the Orzarua? And again, I'll say for Yeshai the Trani too, in terms of the laws of vows and oaths. If somebody wants to hazard a Savara, I will take it. I like when people figure it out. But uh, so, Rabbi, if you get any, uh, any, uh, you know, hatzatzot, it's like uh, the fellow Nebuch Jeopardy died. If somebody rings the bell, you know, uh, call on them. And um, I'm happy to take a, a suggestion. So, so far, uh, nothing yet. Okay, well, we could play the Jeopardy music, but, you know, anyway, um, uh, we won't. Um, and I certainly am not going to sing it. Uh, so let me tell you what I think. Uh, and again, the, the, the connection between these three areas of Jewish law is not completely obvious, but as I start doing it, you'll see where I'm coming from. Why does Orzarua think Rambam is a great resource for Hilchot Shabbat? And I'll add, the Orzarua does something else interesting in Hilchot Shabbat. His other favorite go-to source is Rashi on Shas. Now, there's nothing wrong with Rashi on Shas. He's, he's there, his man. He's their man. It's Lansman. It's all great. Migadol ke Rashi. But in a work of Halakha, you know, Rashi on Shas may not be that helpful because... Rashi's not deciding matters of Jewish law all that much. He's interpreting the Gemara. So just to sharpen the question, 
why does Orzerua cite Rambam so many times in Hilchot Shabbat and Eruvin? Noticeably so. And I'll throw in Rashi with the same money. And the answer is because the Orzerua, again, in the first half of the 13th century, wants to build an Ashkenazic Hilchot Shabbat. He wants to build a nice conceptual, user friendly, uh, you know, uh, uh, well-constructed uh, 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 treatment of Hilchot Shabbat. There are works of halacha coming out of northern France and Germany already. Sefer HaTruma by Baruch ben Yitzchak, who also was one, one, of the, one of the ones who made Aliyah. It's lovely, but it treats Hilchot Shabbos like for a yeshiva bachar. I mean that positively. Here's this halacha, here's that halacha. You know, it's it, very hard to get a conceptual framework there. Same thing is true of the Sefer Yireim. The Yireim is a little more conceptual, but again, there's a dash here, there's a spot here. So even if Orzaru is aware of both of these works, and he probably is, right, he wants to create a, an expanded Hilchot Shabbat. If you want to create a conceptually expanded Hilchot Shabbat, if you want a crib from somebody, you know, you say, get me to rewrite. Who do you borrow? The answer is he has Mishnah Torah. So he doesn't have much use for him apparently in Hilchot Megillah. He doesn't have use for him in Hilchot Pesach. He doesn't have use for him in Hilchot Brach so much. He doesn't have use for him in Hilchot Kedushin, right? Which he talks about extensively. He doesn't have use for him that much in Hilchot Shechita. Apparently in all these areas of law, if you ask him, do you need more sources? He'll say, I'm good. I have all of Northern French and German Tosafist learning, and it's a ton. Look at my book, it's big, very big. I was just on with a potential doctoral student this week and we're talking about, he's talking about the Sefer or Zero. I said, you're gonna rue this because if you wanna work with me, you gotta know the Sefer or Zero very well. He says, oh, I know that, that's okay. I said, good, you got a shot. Anyway, that's what I do in my spare time. Uh, so this uh, Sefer or Zero, what's with Hilchot Shabbat? The answer is for Hilchot Shabbat, the or Zero says, I need the Rambam. I can use the Rambam. And by the way, get me Rashi on Shas too. Why? Rashi will give us the definitions. Rashi will give us the perushim, the, the details. And the Rambam will help us to establish. You look at the 30 chapters of Hilchot Shabbat and the Rambam. It's a, it's a tour de force organizing. What are the Malachot? What is Minha Torah? What is Midera Bonan? What goes with which? What are the middle categories? Right? So the answer is, why does Orzerua cite Rambam so extensively in Hilchot Shabbat? Because he needs him. And I don't mean he doesn't need him in the other areas at all, but in the other areas, apparently he's got all that Ashkenazic material and he's good. Hu Hadin Nami, similarly, but slightly different in Hilchot Gerushin Va'agunot, right? Your job as a Gadol Hador is to provide solutions that will anticipate, God forbid, the Aguna problem. In that area of halacha, there are, unfortunately, or fortunately, never enough solutions unless you check with everyone. So here again, Orzerua says, Rambam, Atamuzman, you're a smart fellow. You have some very interesting solutions. We'll use everything. Right? There's no Ashkenazic tradition of Gitten Vagunot. There's halachic solutions. You have solutions, we bring you right in. Uh, again, he says at one point, I wish I could have gone with him on this because he might be, but I'm not sure if he's right. You know, but in other places he certainly is, right? I'll pasca like you instead of Rosh Bam. Not a problem. Wonderful. I need you in that respect. Right? I'm, I'm acting it out a little bit, but you get the point. Again, mutatis mutandis, dine mamonos, in monetary law and economic law, and not as fraught as agunot, ilchot agunot, but there is no Ashkenaz, I mean, there are some conventions, but there is no Ashkenazic approach to paskening, you know, Hilchel Shomrim or to paskening Hilchel Ribis. In other words, these are, this is an area of halacha where minhogim are not so critical, right? How do you pay your debts? You know, do you pay it with your left hand or your right hand? No such thing, right? So again, it's an area where I can feel free to let in, right? Basically, uh, uh, Jewish monetary law is based on the, the, the broad rules of halacha, fit in good thinking, right? Logical thinking, good thinking that fit in with the halachic principles. Again, Rambam is a welcome guest at the table. And that is why he is used in these areas. I'll say the same thing about Rabbi Shai Detrani. 
Rabbi Yishai the Trani looks at Nedarim and Shavuos. I, you know, I, I almost hear the Rav talking. The conceptual approach that Maimonides has embodied and he's linked it with the practical halacha. Nobody can do that. That's what Rabbi Yishai the Trani said. I have the theory of Nedarim and Shavuot, Hafla'a, which is a very complex issue in Jewish law, right? Hatarat Nedarim. And I've got the technicalities of how you pull this off, how you work this in Beit Din. There's a very interesting merging, which is part and parcel of Mishnah Torah. So again, here's an area where we use them because we need them. And that will explain the selectivity. And that really uh, uh, is a large part of the story um, in, in terms, I, I think, of this question. And to go back to the solution, which was suggested earlier, right? You're absolutely right. Tosfot is busy learning the Gemara and then giving you decisions of Jewish law. They don't need Ramam's decision most of the time. They have them, right? They don't need to expand. To the contrary, so it's not to cut them down, right? Again, by the way, that's like why they like Rabbeinu Hananel, because what does Rabbeinu Hananel do? He explains the Gemara and he paskins the Shail. Oh, we can use his Perushim. That works in our system. The riff again, you know, his psakim are nice, but we don't need his uh, method because we've got our own methods. Um, so, and, and this is actually was suggested by Professor Tasha many years ago to explain that discrepancy. But what I'm saying is we have to add on an important layer. The Orzarua says add an important layer because I'm now gonna run with the ball and we'll conclude, we'll conclude with that. This will then explain a whole bunch of other things. The answer is that Ashkenazim, again, some didn't use him at all. And the answer may be that's why the printed Tosfot statistically hardly use the Rambam, because again, they have no time in the middle of their Tosfot commentary to start launching major halachic decisions. Although they do mention the riff, right? But it's a matter of need to know, need to use. If you look at the solution, second half of the solution paragraph, right? There are others in Germany, and in Northern France for that matter, who cite Rambam extensively but not Mish sometimes Mishta Torah, but even more in right? I'll show you in a moment, we'll almost end with that. The, the German Hasidic Ashkenaz quote Rambam a lot. What are they quoting Rambam on? Hilchus Tshuva, Inyone Tshuva. Other aspects of piyut, uh, of, of pietism. Arugat Habosem, who's a colleague of some of the people that we mentioned, the Orzrua, they all learned this in Sibyl, he learned with Simchem Shpir as well. Uh, Arugat Abosim is a voluminous commentary on Piyutim. Tens of citations of Mishnah Torah, but from the early portions which deal with Shuva, Nevoah, Malachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, whatever you find in Piyutim. So again, so here the point is, if it's not Talmud Vahalacha, Rambam is Muzman. Hey, we, we the Tosafists don't claim to be the absolute experts in Piyut although they wrote extensively. We don't claim to be the absolute experts in other areas of Hashkafa. There, we're happy to cite Rambam. I'll show you an example on the flip side in a moment. Even in Perushim al HaTorah, there are French Balei HaTosvot who cite Mora Nevuchim in their Perushim al HaTorah. So, so much for the Maimonidian controversy. They're citing Mora Nevuchim in their Torah commentaries. Why? As I said, the last line, note the nature and subject matter of these works. So rule one, if it's Talmud Vahalacha, we use Rambam, need to use, or Zarua and Riyad, his colleague. If it's non-Talmudic or Halachic, and, and your point about also style and approach, uh, 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 code versus commentary, which is a Professor Tursky model, commentary versus code, lots, of, lots you can do with that. Um, it's not their style necessarily, it's not necessarily their minhagim, and it's not necessarily something they need. But if it's an area where they need them or where they can use them, it's not just need, if they need them or they can use them, in Talmud Vahalacha, yes. In other areas, much more open to not only Mishnah Torah, but even to um, more Nevuchim. And in fact, let's, we're just about ready to conclude. Yitzi, let's go to page two to the flip side for a second. Then we'll come back to the very, very end of page one and I'll take all your questions. Yitz, great, thank you, terrific. Just to show you, I mean, text number two here is a truly remarkable text. I found it, but I didn't write it. And others are aware of it, so I can't claim what, but I can claim I found it. This is by a certain Rabbeinu Abraham 
Ben Shimshon, a colleague of Elazar of Worms, who was a student of Judah the Pious, Hasidic Ashkenaz, and he has an unbelievable concept here. This is a German uh, pietist, not necessarily a Tosafist, but we're talking mid 13th century, same time. And he has what I call here, Ode to Maimonides as copied from Chumash. What am I talking about? He says here, he says it in Parshas Truma, but it's on the last two verses of the Torah. He says, all great halachic works, all world famous halachic works are hinted at in the Torah. The German pietists are big on remez. They're big on hinting at things, right? Gematri and so on are hinted in the Torah. He says, where are Rambam's great works, Mishnah Torah and Moran Avuchim hinted at explicitly in the Torah? The last two Sukim, right? Talking about Moshe Rabbeinu at the very end of Zot HaBracha. Ulechol hayad hachazaka. Yad hachazaka is the second name for Mishnah Torah because it has 14 parts. Ulechol hamora hagadol. Here he makes a slight emendation, not mora with an olive butt. More with a hey. You know, mora, more, just a vowel, right? Asher asa Moshe. Mishnah Torah. Moranavuchim were written by Moshe. I mean, Moshe la Moshe la Haikam Moshe. You can't think of a better phrase of the Rambam than this, from who knows where, written by a German Jew in the mid 13th century. What? You're hardly citing him. No, 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 no. If we we respect him, and that, by the way, that's the other point. It's clear that the Or Zerua thinks he's a God al Hador. We respect him, we love him. We use him where we need him or where he's not impinging on our Talmud, the halacha, on our methods and our, on our halachic uh, approaches. We love him. Ode to Rambam. Okay. And the second, the text number three, the last text here is an example of a collection of French Tosafist Torah commentaries where on the Pasuk, Nasa Odom, Bitsalmenu Kid Musenu, let us make man in our image, where Yosef Bechor Shor who is a student of Rabbeinu Tam in Talmud, basically puts forward a Maimonidian approach that we're not talking here about any physical imagery of God. We're talking about other uh, points of, of sort of uh, conceptual uh, leadership, right? Um, God is the manager of the world and in the heavens. Man is a sort of lower level manager. That's the way Yosef Horshort does it, based on almost Maimonidian-like constructions. The particular text that you have here is not Yosef Horshor. It's a later colleague of his who took his material and added. And he adds in a quote here that I underlined, you can take a look, from Moran Avuchim, Ubesefer Rab Moshe Ibn Maimon. This, is, this work is completed in 1240 in Northern France, right? So right where we started to talk. Matsati in the work of Moshe Ben Maimon, Ha'oreich, kol ha'oreich demut la borei, anybody who thinks God has a form, humeotam shegehenom kala veinam kalim. He's in big trouble, right? Um, and he quotes Moran Avuchim again. Um, and um, uh, uh, we have other citations, both of Mishnah Torah and Moran Avuchim in these kinds of contexts. So come back, Itzi, please, to page one. We'll wrap it up and I'll give you a nafkamina. I'll give you a ramification of my theory. Thank you. So the solution to the problem is that the non-reception of Rama's Mishnah Torah is a misnomer. It was received and utilized as needed and depending on the area of inquiry. Namely, if it's Talmud v'halacha, it's where does Ramam have something to contribute of particular significance that based on the area of halacha in question, where again, despite the fact that Ramam works differently than they do, they love his solutions, they love his questions, they love his answers. He's a gobble, right? If it's non Talmudic, if it's Chumash, if it's Machshava, if it's Torah Tassod, if it's Pietism, if it's Piyutim, oh, we'll quote Rambam, we have no problem there, because our job is to give you, our job is to cover the Halacha and Minhagim, Halacha the Limud beat in Ashkenaz, the other areas, we are equal opportunity users. And the Nafkamin, if you look at the very last paragraph, and again, the proof that none of this should be taken in any way as anti rambam or anti-philosophy here. It's strategic, it's utilitarian. You can use the same approach to explain 
why Avram ben David of Poskier, the rival of Poskier, Rambam's protagonist, right, in southern France, he's not Ashkenazi, but he's not in the Jewish Muslim world, he's in Christian Europe and so on. If you look, Tosfot on Shas cites Rivid only a handful of times, and I, I can't do it now, but I can get the number five in our printed Tosfot, I can get it down to about two. In manuscript, it's not the Rivid, it's Avraham ben someone else, but okay, let's say five times, right? Again, a terribly small number, right? And here, by the way, for our questioner, um, uh, uh, Rivid, we know, did write Perushim on Shas. So, and, and he's aware of the Tosafists. There's no reason by late 13th century, we know that they were aware of some of his Perushim. They're hardly cited, right? The only time we find Rivid cited extensively in Tosfot land is in Tosfot, not in the printed Shas Tosfot so much, but whether it's Tosfot Harosh or other works, Tosfot to tractate Moed Katan. Moed Katan deals with the laws of the intermediate days of the festivals. Moed Katan deals with uh, laws of Avelut, and that's really this, the whole last part of Moed Katan. Sefer Hasidim talks about, uh, uh, you know, you, you need to teach Avelut because people don't learn, don't, they're, they're nervous about learning it, you should teach it. But the fact is there's very little Ashkenazic material on uh, Hilchot Avelut. So, we don't need Rivet. Why don't we need Rivet? Say the Baoya Tosot again. Rivet is a godel. He has his Provencal methods and his conclusions and his Chidushim. Great. In Talmud Vahalacha, we don't need it. However, when we do need it, uh, i.e., Hilchot Avelut, of course we'll use it. Uh, so the same kind of, of principle will govern uh, uh, this usage. And I would add just one final example. Um, Ibn Ezra, this is a misnomer because of the Marashal. Uh, people think that the Ashkenazim didn't like Ibn Ezra either. And in fact, if you look, Ibn Ezra cited once or twice in Tosot, Rabbeinu Tam takes up his perush and he says, no, 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 we have to disagree. In fact, they had a sort of hit kat foot. Rabbeinu Tam, uh, who died in 1171, and, and Ibn Ezra, who dies not much before, uh, had a, a, a correspondence. And basically, Ibn Ezra says to Rabbeinu Tam, hey, you wrote Piyutim, you wrote poetry, not bad for a Yish Rosh Hashiva. And, uh, and Rabbeinu Tam says back to him, uh, you know, don't try being a Rosh Hashiva, you're a good poet, but it's friendly. It's a very friendly kind of a uh, uh, competition there. Uh, so people think, oh, that they have no use for Ibn Ezra. Open up Balea Tosfot, Balea Torah, where real Tosafists are speaking. Ibn Ezra is their favorite buddy on Perushim, on Pshat Afilu. Why? If it's Chumash, we love Ibn Ezra. If it's Talmud Vahalacha, he's not our man. The Rambam is, of course, more complex with greater veneration. Rambam, who gam gadol the Talmud Vahalacha, but where we don't need him, we don't use him. Where we do need him, or we can use him, v'od eich, and certainly in other areas as well. So that is my, uh, uh, so the title has been proven to be a little bit off. It's not the non-reception, it's the strategic non-reception or the strategic use of Rambam's Mishnah Torah Medieval Ashkenaz. Um, that's what I have to say. I'm happy to take any questions, whether it's clarifications or if I lost you somewhere or if you wanna add or subtract or question or whatever. And I thank you very much for your uh, rapt attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ray Kennerfogel. And any, any questions, any, uh, anyone have questions, comments? I, I guess I'll just, one sort of question or just to make sure I understand. Please. So again, I think it, the way I understand is that um, they certainly didn't reject the Rambam, they respected the Rambam, but they only right. used the Rambam wherever they felt it was necessary or helpful. If anyone wants to sign off, by the way, we're already nine o'clock, feel free, don't, don't, yes, feel I don't like want you, to, you, you oh, don't yeah. need to listen to me. Um, but me. Right, I guess it, it still is true though that, you know, they had a certain pride in their tradition, their way of learning and- right. The Rambam wasn't that. So it wasn't, you know, in some places, you know, the Rambam kind of came in, like took over, right? He became like, right? So it, they still, um, right? It wasn't, it, 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 there, there still is such a difference um, in, in that regard, meaning that in some places, maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, in some places the Rambam came in and they just realized like, you know, that's right. it. He's, you know, he's it. Right. No, precisely right. In other words, the Bali Hattos vote were not ready to cede I don't mean their authority in the in the you know in the in the you know uh, um, uh, you know ruling sense. They weren't ready to cede their Talmudic uh, 
uh, uh, domination to anyone. Um, you know, the Ramban, Nachmanides, talks in several places. You know, he studied in Spain, but he studied with people who study with Balayatosov. And he basically says, you're the greatest, you're the tops when it comes to Talmud. So not in a haughty way, in a, in a self-awareness uh, uh, way, the Tosaf has said, we have a commitment to Talmud v'halacha, there we take a backseat to no one. Having said that, you know, chokma etzel harambam, chokma ta Torah, ta'aminu, right? And so where we can use him or where we need him, right, we will do that. Again, as the gentleman had said before, we're not going to use him so much in Shas Tosfot anyway because the style doesn't quite match. So there are technical issues, but the large issue again is but there too. We don't need him there. We're not going to use him. Where we do, we will, and that explains the Orzaru on the read very, very nicely. Um, in other areas, not that the Tosafists were shrinking uh, wallflowers, but in other you know, other areas of Jewish learning, which they did do a lot of. They wrote a lot on Chumash, that's mostly in manuscript. They wrote a lot on a lot of Piyut, which again, we don't know as well as we might. Uh, they wrote a lot of other things, and there were other areas of endeavor. There, their approach was more lechatchila. Oh, if Ramam has something here to help us, we won't even wonder about it. Let's, let's bring him in as, you know, in other words, I, I don't know if it was quite that distinct, but there, there's a certain, there's an even greater freeness, that freedom, but, but absolutely right. The Rambam does not take over at any time here, right? In other words, the, the wave of Maimonidian domination, it's not domination, it's acceptance. My point is that the way some have constructed it, the two, you know, uh, 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 the two never met, the twain shall never meet. And I think it's just not true. Uh, even though statistically you can say, well, there's an awful, you know, there's a li- not very much citation here. So that's the point, but you have it correct, right? The domination of the Rambam does not happen. Not, not at this time, for sure, in Ashkenaz. And you have to go, you know, uh, you have to go a ways until the Rambam is, is you know, you get, you get to Achronei Ashkenaz, they have no problem, but they need everybody they can get to. So it becomes a whole different story. Right, thank you. Um, good question. Um, Please. The, uh, the Rambam, uh, sorry. Uh, the Toast Road is sort of a commentary on, on Rashi uh, in, in some sense. Right. And Shas, um, it's Rashi and Shas. It's, right. it's, yeah, it's but, but, yeah, but we're focusing on Rashi. So, so the my question is now: the Rambam doesn't really cite his sources, but does the Ram, did the Rambam have Rashi? Did the Ram, did the Rambam actually? That, that's a wonderful question. Somebody wrote a very interesting article uh, on this very question. Uh, Shama Friedman wrote a very interesting article on this question, um, and he has a very sophisticated answer. Um, it's in a volume that was published in Hebrew. Uh, Rashi Haish ve. Olamo or something like that, uh, and it it was done in alphabetical order. So after Karnar Fogel in Hebrew come or right before comes Friedman, I think. So it's right next to one of my articles. So I read this article very carefully. It's a wonderful article. Shama Friedman argues. You know, let's let's do the chronology for a second. Let's do the geography. Right, Rambam dies. Rashi dies in 1104 in northern France. Rambam is born in either 1135, 1138. By 1160 or so, he's already out of Spain. He's already heading towards Fez, then towards Egypt, and so on. What what Shama Friedman suggests, and I don't think he's proven it beyond you know 100 percent, but it's certainly worth thinking about. It does not seem that he again. Do we is he aware of Rashi? ostensibly he should be, although it's interesting, Pinchas Dayan of Alexandria, they're aware of Rabbeinu Tam, it's not clear, they're, you know, they're aware of him, but he's aware of Rashi, but there doesn't seem to be any place of absolute influence except Shama Friedman noted, we do have revisions of Mishnah Torah that the Rambam did, right? Mishnah Torah, he wrote it in his own hand, right? There are these original copies. There are revisions of Mishnah Torah that the Rambam um, undertook, And we don't have that completely. We have pieces. Shama Friedman looked at some pieces in, uh, I don't know if this is is critical, but in Dine Mamonos, and he says that the difference between take one in the Rambam, the Rambam's original formulation, and the revision take two may be that he is now aware of Rashi. (laughs) So the answer to your question is it's a definite maybe. But there's certainly no evidence for any extensive, you know, pre-writing Mishnah Torah formulation, even though, you know, the Ramban in Spain has manuscripts of Rashi that are better than some of the ones in the north. But the Ramban is that much younger than the Ramban. You know, he's much, the the Ramban is born 10 years before Rambam or so dies. So the answer to your question is we have no hard evidence. Uh, It seems no, 
but there may be in some of these revisions, one might suggest that he did become aware. So that's, yeah, I can give you the reference to Shama Friedman's article. You can take a look, but it required a whole article to, uh, to solve your question. Thanks. Sure. One last question or comment, if there is. Yes, if there is, happily. Okay, so if anyone thinks of anything they want to ask uh, right, Karen Fogel, either you have his email or we can get you his email. Right. And, and uh, we, uh, we thank uh, right, Dr. Karen Fogel very much for joining us tonight. And uh, thank again the Ehrenbergs for the sponsorship. Yeshikach, everyone. Thank you. Yeshikach, thank you very much. Very nice to be with you. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.